to turn in your Bibles, uh, Luke chapter 19, uh, as we consider the triumphal entry that Nick has already read to us uh, this morning. I want to mention to you that next week, Easter Sunday, we will have the blossoming of the cross out front, but this year, again, we're going to have a florist to cover uh, the flower, put all the flowers on the cross so you won't have to bring any this year. We'll start that back next year, but just so it's full and ready to go from the first to the last person, we'll have it ready for you. It'll actually be ready uh, late uh, next Saturday evening if you want to come up and take photographs uh, at night, and we'll probably have it lit for you as well, but that's available next week. Also, I uh, want you to know that we will have a 945 service at Keys Ferry for the people that are already there and their families, and those of you who have already mentioned that you want to help us over there, uh, we'll have you to go over there if you'd like to, but you need to register. We have very limited space. The building is not ready. There is no sound system, basically, uh, but we'll have uh, some comp We'll take care of that next week, and so we need you to register at salemchurch.net backslash KF Easter. And again, this is for the folks that attend Keys Ferry already. Those of you that have indicated you want to help us over there, we'd love to have you next week. Uh, the Aiken Brothers Abiding uh, will be, be there leading our worship music that day, as well as Pastor Scott's going to be preaching there. And very soon we'll have a normal uh, routine at Keys Ferry, but we have to wait till everything is complete. So if you want to participate over there, but again, very limited space, but we'd welcome those of you who've indicated you want to help us. And as that goes, listen, I have no doubt that campus is going to do extremely well very quickly, and I want to say this. I'm not looking for folks to leave this campus to go over there. That is not what we need because we're going to have a core group of people and we're going to trust God to bring uh, just phenomenal growth over there and it's going to happen. There's so many people out that way, several good churches not too far away, but there's enough people for the kingdom to reach a boatload of folks among the churches, so continue to be praying for them uh, and then don't forget the blossoming of the cross. And so praise God, he is working powerfully. Uh, Psalm 150 verse 6 says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. In front of me today on this easel are the words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 16 and 17. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You're going to see these scripture verses around this campus and also at Keys Ferry. These are three things that you and I need to be doing all the time. We need to trust God's word and to do what it says. And so 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, and 17 are those things which we need to put into practice. Today's message I want to entitle, Praise That Pleases God. Praise That Pleases God. As we think about the triumphal entry of Jesus, all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, account for this uh, time in Jesus' life. And I want to read to you today from Luke's Gospel, beginning in verse 28. Nick read it from Mark's Gospel. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie the colt and bring it here. If anyone asks, Why are you untying the colt? You tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as the Lord had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and they put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. 
And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, or down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, they cried out. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and he said, If you, even you, Jerusalem, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You know, we could talk about numerous things concerning this text today. We could talk about the donkey. God used that donkey for a great purpose, and that was to bring Jesus into the city. But it was also something that one of the prophets had prophesied of old. See, your king comes riding on the colt of a donkey. And so we could look at that donkey and recognize that God is in the simplest of things. Many years ago, I preached a sermon about that donkey. And I want you to know that God uses the simplest of things to fulfill his purposes and his plans. So don't ever think that your part or what you do to serve the Lord is insignificant. Uh, Yesterday, we were uh, trying to finish up some uh, the beginning of some redecorating around the building. Uh, there's some other things that are going to be done, but uh, we have to have chairs covered and the likes. But yesterday we were going to hang some pictures and place some furniture. And uh, I thought for the most part I could uh, do it all myself without asking others to help me. But, you know, I got here and I thought, man, I've gotten in over my head. And I'm standing there thinking I probably need to put this off till next week, but I'm pretty impatient at times about stuff like that. And I wanted you to have somewhere nice to sit and something to look at. So I'm standing there with all this stuff, and I look out in the parking lot, and there's Marshall Payne and his son, Seth. And they're just kind of wandering around. Well, I open the door, and I said, Marshall, what's going on? He starts towards me, and he said, listen, Pastor, He said, Seth and I just came up here to see if there's anything we can do today to help out. We need to do something today. He didn't have a clue, and I hadn't announced it. And I just looked at him, and I said, praise the Lord. I said, you're not going to believe this. I need y'all's help. And so for the next several hours, uh, we worked around here in the foyers and, and did certain things, and, and Seth learned to do some stuff he'd not done before, and it was, it was just the blessing of God. And I bet I said five times, guys, I want you to understand, God used you all today to help me to accomplish something I couldn't have gotten done, and my back would have never withstood it. But you see, even the simplest of thing in coming with a tape measure, figuring out where to put a picture hanger and putting the picture on it can be used to further the name of Jesus Christ and to create an environment where people feel welcomed and warm and fellowship can take place. And so even yesterday, I was mindful that Pastor Scott mentioned last week a nine-year-old girl put a stack of dollar bills together, brought them to the offering, and put on there, I want this to go to the new church, referring to Keys Ferry Campus, to help with the renovations. And God put it on the heart of a senior adult lady to write a substantial check, also like the little girls, uh, for Keys Ferry. And listen, a miracle is happening there. People just keep volunteering. People keep bringing money. And, and we've not really had to ask for anything because God is doing a work in advance there by providing for each and everything that we need in preparation for that. Now, there's probably going to come a time very soon where I'm going to have to say, folks, we've got to pass the collection plate to finish this. But so far, God's people just keep bringing 
money, bringing resources, time and talent to pull this off. So what we could look at with the triumphal entry is the, dumb, the donkey and the colt and say that God uses the simplest of things to bring about his plan of redemption. Or we could talk about our Jewish friends and how they're blinded to the gospel. We could think about the fact that they have just entered into Passover and we should pray for the Jewish people that during this Passover season that many of them would recognize that the Lamb of God has already come in Jesus Christ. You see, today we worship a Jewish Messiah, an olive-skinned Jew. The problem is they don't recognize that the Jew we worship who was brought to us through them is in fact their Messiah and we need to be praying for the scales of blindness to fall from their eyes and for them to be saved. And Romans chapter 11 promises us that many in Israel, it says all will be saved. It's all those that God will bring in will be saved. But today what I want us to think about in this text is praise that pleases God. You see two aspects of praise in this text. First of all, there is the momentary praise of the crowd. And then there is the maturing praise, the mature praise of the Christ. Jesus Christ presents to us a godly picture of praise in this text, and then the crowd's praise was momentary. And so as we think about that, I'm reminded of what it's like to go to Jerusalem and come down the Mount of Olives on the Palm Sunday Road. Many of you have been there with us, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. You begin to reflect on what it must have been like that day in the city as Jesus was coming in. And so we think about that day as the psalmist said, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What were those people rejoicing over? Y'all, they were believing that after centuries and centuries of time, that God who had been silent for 450 years was now bringing about uh, the culmination of all of their hopes and their dreams and that the Messiah was coming. But they believed Jesus to be the Messiah. The problem is he was the Messiah of their own thinking. They thought he was going to be a militant Messiah and that he was going to come in like a victorious king and overthrow the Roman Empire and bring Israel up to being a world power. That's what they were thinking. Think about Simon the Zealot, for example. He was a politically motivated Jew who carried a sword about this long and on a normal day he would have taken Matthew the tax collector out because he saw Matthew as a traitor against the Jewish people but Jesus brought the two together but the people as a whole had been looking for a military political leader and they thought Jesus was going to be that person but he was not that kind of Messiah. Praise the Lord. He was a redeeming Messiah who became for us the sacrificial lamb to pay the price of our sins. And so the people are applauding. They're waving their palm branches with great exuberance and they're shouting Hosanna, which means save in its original context. Now it is a statement of, of praise to say that. But the other gospel writers record that they were crying out, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The king they were focusing on. Luke said it this way. He said they began to joyfully to praise God in loud voices. That sounds great, doesn't it? But they praised God for all the miracles that they had seen. This is concerning to me and it happens today. People praise God for the miracles when they should have been praising God for the Messiah, the God-man, Jesus. They were looking for self-benefit, self-gain. They thought they were fixing to become somebodies, if you will, on the world stage. So there's the praise of the, the moment and the crowd. They, they cried out, but listen, this is something we need to be mindful of in our time, in all times. These people applauded Jesus, would soon abandon Jesus. Listen, Palm Sunday was an amazing day, it appears in Scripture. 
But just five days later, the applause turned to anger. Those who hailed him as the king, as he came in, would just five days later begin to hiss at him. Those who followed Jesus would soon fall away from him. Those who cried crown him on Sunday would cry crucify him on Friday. Those who jubilantly waved their palm branches on Sunday on Friday would shake their jeeringly their fists at him and holler crucify him. Momentary praise is based on circumstances. You know, some people will say, praise God. He did this for me. He did that for me. And that's our nature. And listen, it's a, it's a troubling thing, but it's an understandable thing. I was watching the news early this morning, and I heard this uh, dear lady from Alabama. She said, thank the good Lord above. He delivered me from the storm. Well, if we're not careful, that implies that it was the good Lord above who took out the neighbor. You understand that? Listen, we're to thank God if our house is destroyed, and we're to thank God if our house is still standing. We're to thank God if we've lost a loved one or our own life uh, in a storm or if we have been brought through. God is good, and his presence is what we praise. The not just the miracle of being spared, but thank God he was with us in the storm. The disciples that we know, the 12, they stuck close to Jesus on Palm Sunday, but soon they distanced themselves from him. Even Peter, who like you and me would say, Lord, not me, I'm not going to abandon you, I'm not going to depart from you, but Jesus said, be careful, Peter. Because Satan very soon is going to sift you like wheat. Wallace Vett said, at best, Palm Sunday is a day of triumph. At worst, Palm Sunday is an illustration of the fickle nature of people's voices. Boy, could I illustrate that as it relates to church life. The reality is you could as well. Some of you are old enough to remember George Bush Sr.'s presidency. I was uh, looking yesterday at Facebook, and I don't even know what family it was. Somebody posted a picture, and I, there were five little children, and there was a young lady that I thought, man, that must be their older sister. I got to looking a little closer. It was her mother. You have to understand, when I look at Lauren at 30 years old, I still see a little girl. Is anybody else with me? I mean, Kristen out there has got her three little uh, girls. They're not so little anymore, but she's still a 15-year-old in the youth group. And, you know, so uh, that's a good thing, and you ought to enjoy it while it lasts. Do you realize just a few years ago I still look like a little kid? Now I look like an old man. There was no in-between for me. It went from being a guy that everybody said, man, you look too young to be in a pastor, and now people are starting to call me Moses and think I'm about to depart the earth. Listen, man, it goes by fast. But what we've got to understand is when George Bush was president in February of 1991, I believe it was, and we attacked Iraq and took out Saddam Hussein, George Bush had one of the highest approval ratings of any president in the history of the United States. He was up in the 90s. But then what happened? Some of y'all remember the economy began to be sluggish, and it began to take a downward turn, and that's how Bill Clinton beat George Bush, who was soaring in popularity, and then the economy. And let me tell you something. Most people vote on their pocketbooks rather than values. Whatever can benefit them. You remember when Jesus came in, they were all applauding because they thought their king of their own making was coming into town. And what God's plan was calling for was something completely different. And you and I need to understand that momentary praise can change in an instant. And this is a good time to say this. Because knowing all of you, the blessing is I know some of your strengths and your weaknesses. Folks, I want to tell you something today from personal experience. If you live your lives trying to win the approval of people, you're going to be let down over and over again. 
whether it's your parents, whether it's your peers, whether it's your pastor, whoever it is, your value is not to be found in what people think about you. Your value is to be found in what God thinks about you, and he loves you so much, he put his son on the cross for you and for me. That makes you of great value. And your beauty and your worth is not based on what somebody says about you or to you, because let me tell you something. I have lived in a world where somebody will say, you're the greatest pastor. And then I hear him say it to the next guy. Listen, I've heard it all. And if I lived my life based on what the people in the pew say about me or don't say about me, I'm going to be a stressed out person. And one day I'm down, one day I'm up. Listen, it's nice when you say, man, that was a great sermon. But the same people are often the ones that say, that was terrible. What, you know, what in the world? But what I'm trying to tell you is, you and I need to do what Jesus did. And when Jesus rode in on that donkey, folks, let me remind you of this. This is an add-in on the sermon. There was a lot of applause. There was a lot of applause. But Jesus was looking through it and beyond it. Let me tell you something. He knew on the opposite side of the Temple Mount was a place called Golgotha. And that's where he was going. He knew. And so he didn't get caught up in the momentary praise. But yet what Jesus was listening for is the same voice he'd been listening for since his earliest days. And that is the voice of the Heavenly Father. Well done, my beloved son. And you know what? Just like Eric Liddell doing it. How many of y'all remember Chariots of Fire, the movie? Most of y'all aren't old enough. Go back and look it up. Eric Liddell was a Jewish man that ran in the Olympics and won a gold medal. But he made this statement when it was during his period at his height. He said, listen, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. And the reality is you and I, like Eric Liddell, can feel God's pleasure in our life when we are doing what he's called us to do, whether it's like Marshall and Seth yesterday, just coming with hearts of service and saying, what can I do? Folks, I want to tell you something. Had they not showed up yesterday, I would have just kept pressing through to do everything I was going to do, and I would have been of no use today. I know it. But praise the Lord, they came alongside and helped us get everything in place, cleaned up, and departed. And you come in today and may or may not have even noticed what has taken place. But what I want to tell you is the simplest thing is huge. One of our men recently just showed up on a Saturday and cleaned up all the property over at Keys Ferry, every bit of it, and it was massive. And what was, uh, happened was that when I went back, listen, it was so refreshing that I didn't have to think about, or Scott didn't have to think about, calling these people together to help. And so what we need to know is that we are valuable to God and we matter. But listen, don't worry about momentary praise. And don't let it be that which causes you to feel valued or unvalued. So the people, momentary praise. You understand they were cheering for Jesus on Sunday and screaming ugly words at him on Friday. I got a sad letter note this morning on my phone from someone whose husband has basically abandoned them. And it was uh, just sad. And the reality is too many people know in this room that the people you think love you the most will abandon you or abuse you, or don't care about you. Let me tell you something. Jesus sticketh closer than a brother. It's his voice that we need to be concerned about, and then all other voices will fall into place. So there was that voice of momentary praise, the crowd. But then there was the voice of mature praise. Let me me just mention something that before I go any further, I mentioned in the first service. Honestly, I don't remember where I plugged it in, but I want to mention it to you. January the 6th, 2021, showed me exactly how Jesus ended up on the cross. Now, we know it was God's plan, 
but how to bring it about, that's something where the will of man played in. Uh, God knew he was going to die on a cross, gave him as a sacrificial uh, sacrifice, but here's what happened. I think on that Palm Sunday, some folks began to say to the to their friends and neighbors, listen, Jesus is coming into town. Let's line the road and wave palm branches. You realize that what happened here this morning didn't just happen. Brian said to the ladies, hey, ladies, what do y'all think about bringing the kids in? Let them wave some palm branches and it'll be great. I mean, that was orchestrated, right? It didn't just happen. You can understand this. It didn't just happen in Jesus' time either. The right people told other people, y'all get on the road down from the Mount of Olives into the Kidron Valley, and we're going to go across to the Eastern Gate, and we want everybody to be prepared because we think he's the Messiah. The leaders told the people that followed them, and all this played out momentary praise. But you also need to understand, on the morning as they were entering into Passover, people started passing word. I bet the Sanhedrin, all of them said, all 70 of them, you go this way, you go that way, and we're all going to meet at Antonia's fortress, and we're going there to incite a mob into a riot so that Pilate will put him to death. We can't put him to death, but we can get him to put him to death. And so what happens is they're all standing there, and Pilate's trying to give Jesus, uh, let's set him free. What do you want me to do with him? And some Pharisee says to some good old boy beside him, holler out, crucify him. Let's put that guy to death. Trust me on this. And some other Pharisee whispers in another guy's ear, hey, man, trust me. we got to get rid of this guy. He's trouble for us. And they started, all of them, crying out, crucify him. What does that have to do with January 6th? There are people in this room and other people in our community that we know that went up to Washington to the rally up there, and all their intent was to do was go wave a flag, let their voice be heard, have a big time, get some food, hang out with other people that love America, and, you know, just go up to Washington. But what happened? Some people orchestrated a difficult day, and what happened is everybody just started moving towards the Capitol, and the crazies got everybody incited, and I'm telling you, no doubt, there are people that ended up in that Capitol that never on a normal day would have ended up in that Capitol. It was a mob riot. It was incited by a few people. Listen, it's obvious. It happens all the time. People get into protest and do things they wouldn't do by themselves or in a small group. So I'm sitting there watching this thing unfold on the television, and I'm sitting there looking, and one of my dear friends, whom I love greatly, and many of y'all know him, he's out there just a Facebook and away, telling us all this going on. He does not know what's happening thousands of yards away and that things are going south quickly. So I'm texting him, calling him, got his attention, and I said, man, turn the crowd back. Tell people to be peaceful. Tell people to go the other way. This thing's getting ugly very quick. His first response was, man, nothing's going on. And I'm telling him, I'm seeing it. I'm looking at it. They're knocking out windows. They're fighting policemen. Turn around and get out of there. Now, you know what I could have done? Nothing. I could have just said nothing. But I knew that I had a responsibility to tell people who have good minds to do what is right and get out of there before they got in trouble. And the reality is all of us need to realize, listen to me, we think we are above being in the crowd that would have cried crucify him, but the fact is most people will give in to their peers. Most people will go along in the church, in the community, just go along. And you know what? Sometimes you got a leader that is not needing to be a leader and they're, you know, they're a, they're an underminer, they're a grumbler and a complainer, and because everybody wants to be in the popular crowd, nobody deals with them. How many of y'all remember somebody like that in high school? There was a guy about this tall. Everybody's scared to death of the guy. I look back and think, what in the world were we thinking? You know, I saw a picture of a person recently that was the most popular guy in the school, and I thought, that poor guy, man, he's worn out and wore out. And you know, you're sitting there thinking low at yourself, but here's my point, y'all. Good people get sucked into bad things real quick. And by the way, there are no good people. We're all sinners headed for a devil's hell. But you know what I mean when I say good. 
So the momentary praise turned to uh, eternal pain. I mean, think about it. You and I put Jesus Christ on the cross. How does that make you feel? Our sin, that little candy bar I stole when I was five years old is the first time I remember the sin that put Jesus on the cross, and it just got worse from there. But then there's that mature praise. That's what Jesus did. Each one of these could be a whole sermon series. The glorious beauty of the life of Jesus was that all, in all things he was mature and consistent in all things. From childhood through adulthood, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same boy that went to Torah school when he was five years old is the same man that died on a cross at 33 years old. The Apostle John in John 13, 15 records the words of Jesus. And Jesus says, I have set before you an example that you should do as I have done. Whatever Jesus did, he's telling us we should do. And then in chapter 16, I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So God gives us his word. This is the guidebook. You will be blessed if you do them. And so when we think about Jesus' consistent life, what Jesus did was he was riding in on the donkey for the pleasure of God, not the pleasure of men. He was looking to please God. And let me remind you, Jesus knew how it was going to play out. He had been telling, all through Luke's gospel, it's talking about Jesus set his face to Jerusalem as they were going up to Jerusalem. You need to understand what Luke intended to say was Jesus knew all along how it was going to turn out. And he went still. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the final battle was fought. It was not on the cross. Jesus determined and decided to go to the cross and to surrender everything in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so when we think about Jesus, we need to look at Jesus and realize he is a worthy example of following. What did his praise reveal? What was the fruit of Jesus' life and his praise? First of all, Jesus teaches us how to have a praiseworthy character, a, a character that brings praise to God. It is so simple, y'all. Galatians 5, and 23, Paul wrote uh, to the church, he said, these are the fruits of the Spirit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of a person who walks in the Holy Spirit, and you have to mature in that. Now, you can do a study if you want to, and you can look at Jesus' life and say, all right, the fruit of love. Where do we see that in Jesus' life? Well, you could say the woman at the well. Nobody else valued her, but Jesus showed his love towards her and valued her and redeemed her. Uh, what about patience? Think about this with me. You all, everybody still here? Patience. Think about the Pharisees. If you were Jesus, but you were you, I mean, the way you are today, would the Pharisees have gotten on your nerves? Yeah, they'd get on my nerves just reading about them. And if we had been Jesus and you had the power to do anything, what would you have done? Well, first thing I would have done, just like Noah built an ark, I would have built an airplane. In the time of Jesus, you know, he could have designed an airplane and blown everybody's. You think, talk about a miracle. Look at that thing. It can fly. No different than the time of Noah with an ark. So if I was Jesus, I would have built an airplane. And then I would said to the Pharisees, we're going to have a meeting, and there's 70 seats on the inside. And then I would have gotten Pilate, who wasn't a pilot, but I'd have had him fly the plane, and I'd have put him in the front seat uh, with his buddy Herod, and he, Pilate would have piloted the plane, and Herod could have been the chief you know, a flight attendant, and then the 70s of the Sanhedrin, I'd have just sent them into exile somewhere never to be seen again. 
But you know what Jesus exhibited towards the Pharisees? Patience. And you know what? It paid off. How did it pay off? Listen, folks, you got to step into the story to get this stuff. I didn't just come up with this. I mean, it takes time. If you step into the story, the patience of Jesus towards the Pharisees paid off. Where was Jesus buried? Where? In Joseph's tomb. Joseph was from Arimathea, and he was rich. And then who else helped him put Jesus in the tomb? Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee who came to Jesus at night and said, what must a man do to gain eternal life? And Jesus said, you must be born again. There's no indication there that Nicodemus is saved. But listen, Nicodemus takes takes it all and puts it on the table. He loved Jesus so much, he even buried him, and he knew that would be costly. By the way, Pharisees didn't deal with dead bodies. So what we see is Nicodemus puts his faith in a dead Jesus at high cost. Y'all, I'm convinced that it is the patience of Jesus that will allow you and me to have a conversation with Nicodemus in heaven. You see what I'm saying? Self-control. We looked at blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What What does meekness mean? It means strength under what? Control. Jesus said, did you not know that I could have called 10,000 times 10,000 angels and my father would have dispatched them? But you see, Jesus exhibits self-control because his character was a character of godly praise. What about his conduct? In every step of his life, Jesus always did the right thing. Mother, you uh, you think it's stressful to have a busy child. Imagine having a perfect child. A perfect child who never says anything to you about what you're doing wrong, but who just looks at you when you get a little testy with your spouse. I mean, think about it. Jesus, just look at Mary, y'all, and Joseph. And y'all need to settle down in here. You know, our kids never really challenged us in our relationship at home, but little Julianne, she'll come in there and she'll look at you like, What are y'all arguing about? You're not supposed to argue. You're grandparents. You're supposed to be perfect. We said, go in the other room. (laughs) But she does this. But Jesus, he just looked at his grandparents. He just looks at his friends like, y'all really going to do that? You're not going to do it with us, Jesus? Are you kidding? I'm God. No, he didn't say it that way, but his conduct So it's worthy of following his conversations. You realize Jesus never told an off-color joke, men? And by the way, when somebody else started to, he just looked at them, Coley. Like, you're not really going to tell this in front of me, are you? Conversations, Hebrews 13, 15. Let us, through Jesus, continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise through Jesus, the fruit of lips that confess his name. In our conversations, we can praise God. And through converts or conversions, Paul said it this way, I'm a, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. We need to pray for the Jews, as I mentioned earlier. But do you realize when Jesus saw Zacchaeus in the tree, His act of praise to the Father was to pause and to stop in his busy schedule and say, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. I need to spend some time with you today. For what purpose? For the man's salvation. There's a beautiful story of what it means uh, to have fruit of redemption in your life. Zacchaeus' life gives testimony, fruit of his life, but Jesus was concerned about conversions and he dealt with people on that as an act of praise to God. When you and I witness to another person with a heart of praise, God works in their lives. Another thing Jesus was was charitable. People were hungry, and what did Jesus do? He fed them. He used material resources and provided them to meet the needs of people. Jesus was generous. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9 talks about whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Was Jesus a cheerful giver? Absolutely. Jesus was generous, and we ought to be generous. Just last week, I think it was, I told you about this pastor uh, intern in, in Nepal, and he needed Bibles. Well, we've sent him the money. You've sent him the money through your gifts to the church, and we've sent uh, money for Bibles. He sent me photographs of people all huddled up and together and all little children to, to adults in this room. The church is gathered, not in a sanctuary like this, but just a room. People don't have their shoes on, and they're all holding their Bible up. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to shame our church by saying, if you have your Bible today, hold it up, because 50-plus percent of you don't have your Bible today. But all of those people, all of them, and see, they live in a place where you're not supposed to have a Bible, and if they could just get a page, they'd be thankful, much less the whole thing. But Jesus was generous, and you and I need to be generous. Do you realize Jesus held nothing back? If you give your lifeblood for the whole world, you've held nothing back. When the first stimulus checks went out, an elderly couple in the church asked me to drop by that they had a check they wanted to give to the church. It was $2,400. And they said this, we've been blessed. Trump sent us this money and we don't need it. Let's let the Lord have it. A lot of y'all just got checks here recently and you really weren't expecting them and you may not need them. Be thinking about the possibility of giving some of that away, if not all of it, for the work of the Lord. Hebrews 13, 16, do not forget to do good and to share with others. For such, with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Let me tell you something. God is pleased by a person whose heart and love for him overflows by being kind and generous towards other people. Do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. In my Bible, I've written down that we need to... Uh, to praise God with our lips, that's through our words. We need to do good deeds with others, that's our walk. And we need to share with others as there's a need. That's through our wealth. But then there's this. Jesus' life praised God in his commitment. And I've already touched on this through the whole message. You remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he basically said this, I'm paraphrasing it today, Daddy, I don't really want to have to do this. I've been perfect through all eternity. I've never known the taint of sin. I've never known a moment of displeasure towards you and, or any brokenness in our relationship. I really don't want to bear this cup. However, if this is the only way I willingly lay down my life that I might honor you, the Father and the Spirit, and do my part for the redemption of man. So not my will, but yours be done. I'm going to trust the plan. And it was there that the victory was won. And y'all, Jesus' commitment was total and it was complete. It was not partial. When I told my dad that I was going to go into full-time ministry after six years of kind of praying through it and, you know, pushing back a little bit on the call of God, the people at Chattahoochee Baptist Church could not pay me enough to survive, basically. And so they said this. They said, we don't have a problem if you want to keep selling real estate, no problem. I said, thanks. But I'm telling you something. The day I walked out of my office and moved my desk that's in my office here into the office at Chattahoochee Baptist Church, I never worked another real estate dealer and they've never made another dime off of real estate. Why? Why? Because I gave my whole self to the cause of the ministry. Now, have I been involved in some real estate deals? Yeah. 80-something acres over here, 26-something acres over there, helping other people. But I've not made a dime or profited off of real estate, and I let my license go. Why? Because just like Peter walked away from that fishing boat and those nets, I walked away from that profession because my God called me to be a fisher of men, not the seller of real estate. And you know what God did? 
He provided every day along the way. And I'm telling you that because the same thing happened to Zacchaeus. Read the story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. It actually, it's 19, I think, but here, here's what I want you to ask you today. Is your life committed to Jesus? Y'all, we're not talking about, I'm not talking about today the fact that you say, I'm a Christian, and then you live like the location south of town. I'm talking about hell. You know, we can all say, I'm a Christian. Yeah, right, show me some fruit. You know, you can stand around all day long, tell people you're an apple tree. Produce some fruit in keeping with righteousness. You can say, you know what, I'm from Georgia, I'm a peach tree. You know, you're not a tree, you're a person. You can say you're anything you want. The guy, remember I told you years ago about a, a man that walked into church, an elderly man, he wanted some cash. And we said no. And, and Larry's in there with him, and Larry'd come back and talk to me, and he'd go back. And when we told the man no for the final time, Donald, the man, said to Larry, what, what are you telling me? I can't have the money. He said, let me tell you something. He said, I'm God. He said, and I'm telling you, it's my will for you to give me money. Larry came and told me this. I said, what do you do? I said, go back and tell him to make some money and give us some. The man was Lulu in his head. But here's the thing, y'all. The question comes, are we committed? This morning I had bacon and eggs for breakfast. Generally, on a normal Sunday, my wife cooks for me to get me ready for this day. Now, I wish I could tell you we do that seven days a week, but that doesn't happen, and I don't do it for her anymore. In our old age, we're not getting, we're just kind of lax about some things, but she cooks bacon and eggs for me, and so this morning, the bacon tasted a lot better than the eggs, by the way. I don't know what it was. The eggs just weren't working. They were great, but they weren't working. Felt kind of nauseous about them. Well, so I'm working on this message. You all know the story. The chicken contributed. The chicken laid the egg and walked on. The pig went to the block and gave it all. Sausage, tenderloin, bacon, shoulder, butt, everything. There is no more pig. It's just on the plate. Y'all, Jesus didn't partially commit. He went the whole way. And I want to tell you that when it comes to following Jesus, you ought not to divide yourself between the world and Christ. By the way, Jesus said you can't serve two masters. Either you'll love one and hate the other. But we got to do like Joshua, choose this day whom we're going to serve. And so I want to ask you today, who are you going to serve in your life? Praise team, y'all come on up here. Revelation 22, verses 12 and 13 says, Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Listen, you may fool everybody on this earth. But when the Lord comes, he's coming with your reward. And those that look like they did nothing, he's going to have a lot for. Because maybe they did more than anybody ever realized. And those who we thought, maybe there's nothing. It's going to be a day where everything's going to be revealed. And so today, we need to live for the praise of God's glory. How are we doing? I want to ask everyone to stand today for the reading of the word here. Listen, this is the last of the Psalms. The last of the Psalms. 150 psalms, and this is the final one. Through all the ups and downs of life, and the psalmist ends this way. This is it. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with the tambourine and yes, praise Him with dancing. Praise Him with strings and with flute. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. 
Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The last three words of all 150 Psalms, the last of the book are the three words, praise the Lord. That's the whole purpose of life, to praise the Lord. But in our sinful estate, you and I cannot praise the Lord because we are depraved in mind and heart and spirit. But God, who is rich in mercy, has made a righteousness for us that is from God, not of us. And so what we do is entrust our life to Jesus and he brings it up from the dead and restores us to the purpose for which God created. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's pray.